All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. My name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these Office Hour Hangouts, uh, where webmasters and publishers can join in. And there's a bit of noise. Um, uh, where webmasters and publishers can join in and ask their questions all around web search and their websites. Uh, there are a bunch of questions submitted, uh, but I know at least one of you is here at a really late middle of the night time. Uh, if you want to get started with your questions, feel free to jump on in now. Uh, sure, yeah. If, if I may, I, I have a couple. Um, so uh, first question is um, let's say there's a website where uh, users can rate poems that other users write. Given the update to the ratings and reviews, uh, rich snippets, uh, we're no longer able to support the creative work property with the aggregate rating schema for rich snippets. So what do you suggest, given that our users do rate these poems, and we'd like for those to show up in the SERP? Uh, you, yeah. I, I mean, from from a technical point of view, you'd need to use the the type of schema markup that matches the primary object of the page, and if that's a poem and that only works with creative work, then that th those reviews would have to be based on that, and we might not show that in the search results. Uh, so. I, I don't think there's there's much of a way around that. It, it wouldn't be that you'd be able to say, well, this poem is suddenly a product, and we'll let people review it based on that. Um, it kind of is is what it is there. So I don't know if there's a real workaround to making those available in search. I see. Yeah, it, it didn't really seem like. Um... There was any property that made sense. I think the closest one was media objects, but um, even even that was a bit of a stretch. Yeah. But uh, okay. Um, the other question is, um, let's say a website. Um, you know, you, you search for keyword X, and a domain that usually ranks for similar keywords doesn't show up on you know page one, even page two or three. And at the bottom of the SERP, I, I believe this would occur on page one, there's a, sometimes a show a, a omitted results link. Mm -hmm. And upon clicking that link, the domain that didn't show up now appears. So what would cause that domain to be originally omitted from the results? So the show omitted results link uh, in, in the search results is basically shown when we would have multiple results that would show the same snippet or same preview, uh, essentially. So that's something where we, we find it doesn't make much sense to show users the, the exact same snippet in the search results multiple times for different pages. Uh, so we try to pick one of these pages and show that one. And with the emitted results link, you can kind of see the others as well. Uh, so if, if a website is only visible when, when you click on that, usually that's a sign that we, we found the same content somewhere else, and we're currently just ranking that version uh, rather than the, the version on that particular website. OK, um, that sounds good. Thank you. And I, I do have one last one. Um, let's say a, a website has uh, a, a lot of URLs. Um, let's say it's 100 million. And um, of those that are crawled daily by Googlebot, um, maybe a tenth of a percent are 410 status. Now, at some point in time, let's say maybe overnight, that website decides to remove 20 million URLs. Um, simply because they're, they're no value to users. Some of these might be crawled by Google fairly often. Some of them might even be indexed. Um, but now that these 20 million URLs are removed, let's say most of them end up getting a 410 status, um, and Google starts 
crawling uh, of the, the the URLs that Google crawls on a daily basis, let's say a large percentage of them now have this 410 status. So instead of it being a tenth of a percent, maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 7%. Uh, what, what signal might this send to Googlebot despite ultimately improving the quality of, of the URLs that it could crawl? That's essentially a non-issue for us. So when, when it comes to ranking, um, that that wouldn't change anything. It's not it's not a bad sign. It's not a good sign. Uh, it's essentially just you have fewer URLs. Uh, with regards to crawling in in the short term, probably not much will change. We would still try to crawl these URLs even if they return 404 or 410. And in the long run, we would probably concentrate our crawling more on the URLs that do return 200, where we've seen the other ones that return 4, 404 or 410. We, we just don't crawl them as frequently. So from a ranking point of view, like nothing really would change there. Um, it might be that you would see kind of a subtle effect of kind of the concentration of the value more on the pages that you have left. Um, but it definitely wouldn't be a negative effect. I see. So, so Googlebot wouldn't. Um... Uh, let, let's say perceive this this change negatively, uh, despite the significant increase in four ten status uh, URLs. Yeah, that definitely wouldn't be a negative thing. I mean, four hundred four, four ten is essentially just a sign that these URLs no longer exist, and sometimes a lot of URLs don't exist anymore. But that's not a sign that the rest of the website is bad, or that anything is is kind of broken, and we need to be more cautious with crawling. It's just well, those URLs don't exist. We we have the other ones that do exist. We'll focus on those. OK. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you for the answers. Cool. Thanks. Uh, anyone else want to get started with a question before I jump into those that were submitted? No? OK. Maybe along the way. We'll see. Uh, all right. Uh, today, I got a message from Search Console. Seems lots of people get messages from Search Console um, saying that my website has the following issues, text too small, clickable elements too close, content wider than screen. However, my site successfully passed Google's mobile friendly test, and no issues were found. Is that a bug? Should I take any action? Uh, so I, I get this question from time to time. Uh, I, I think. It's on the one hand, it's a little bit confusing on our side in Search Console. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes I, I think it's also OK to flag these kinds of issues. Uh, so practically, what, what is probably happening here uh, without knowing the, the actual URLs that you're looking at, uh, my guess is what's happening is that these pages are mobile friendly. Uh, when we look at them in a mobile browser, and they load completely, then we, we can see that they're mobile friendly. Uh, we, we essentially recognize that the text is readable, the elements are appropriately spaced, the, the content has the, the right viewport set, all of that. Um, but what might be happening is from time to time, when we try to render these pages to test them to see if they're mobile friendly, uh, something breaks. So we, we might have, I don't know, 1,000 pages that we're looking, that we're testing for mobile friendliness. And of those, every now and then something breaks. So we have a handful of pages that essentially don't pass the mobile friendliness test that we do on an automated basis. Uh, so in practice, what would happen is we would flag those handful of pages to you in Search Console uh, so that you can take a look to see if this is really something that is broken on those pages, which you can test using the, the mobile friendly test yourself, or if this is something that's kind of just uh, kind of like a flaky test, uh, where sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And often with those kind of flaky tests, if it's not something that's significantly visible across your website, if it's really just a handful of URLs, then that's fine. That, that can happen. If you're working on a bigger website, then every now and then something, when we try to test it, it just won't work. The next time we test it, it'll be fine. Uh, so that's not anything that I'd particularly worry about there. Um, 
good mute so you a little bit of background noise um so it's not necessarily a bug that we would send you these messages it's essentially my guess is we're we're mostly seeing that things are okay and just every now and then it the the pack the test doesn't work out uh, so we flag those uh, what's the latest position from Google in terms of how much weighting it gives to content hidden behind read more drop-down links, uh, such as JavaScript functions, uh, especially now that indexing is moving to mobile first and we're encouraged to design best practices for mobile users? Uh, so with, with mobile first indexing, if content is loaded in the page, and it's just not visible. It's behind something like a tab or an accordion or something similar. Uh, then we will treat that as normal content of the page uh, with the assumption that this is something that users can access uh, if they, they recognize the accordion function or the tab or kind of the read more, drop down links, all of those things. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the easy part. Uh, however, you dropped uh, an aspect into your question that might be something that we'd see differently. Uh, namely, uh, you're saying this is behind JavaScript functions. Uh, so there, there's a difference, difference uh, from, from our point of view between functions or kind of functionality that you have on the page that is loaded by default and functionality that has to be loaded on interaction. And functionality that is visible in the page by default, which is in the HTML, maybe it's not visible by default, but it's in the HTML by default, that's everything that we can pick up and index right away. However, if there's something on your page that needs some kind of interaction to load so that it's even in the HTML, uh, for example, if you use JavaScript to load something from, from your database or from your APIs, and then show that to the user when they click on something, then that's something that we would not know about. So we would not know where to click on your pages to trigger this kind of interaction with your server to load more content. Uh, so that's, that's the aspect that, just purely from a technical point of view, uh, we, we wouldn't know what, what to do to load that content. So we wouldn't be able to index that content. However, like I mentioned, if it's already in the HTML, if you can do view source or inspect element and it's in your HTML by default, it's just not visible by default, then that would be fine. Uh, with the likes of Facebook moving away from likes and with many leveraging fake likes, what will Google do about social ranking signals? So, the, the good news here is that nothing will change, um, in particular, because we don't use these signals. Uh, so that's kind of, yeah, make, makes it a little bit easier, I guess, for you uh, in the sense that we, we don't use these likes anyway as a ranking signal. So if, if a social network were to change those signals, then that's totally up to them. Uh, it's not something that, that would affect us in, in any particular way. Um, a lot of the, or, or some of the reasons, I guess, why we don't use those signals is that purely it's, it's really hard to even keep up if we were able to crawl all of those pages. Uh, so you can imagine a, a large social network that it has a lot of content that keeps coming and going. Uh, and uh, if we needed to refresh all of that content so quickly that we could pick up all of these social signals, then that would be really kind of tricky. Uh, so we don't use those. Uh, what scenarios would cause Google Analytics to report organic traffic as direct? I don't really know much about Google Analytics, so I can't really say anything particular to that. Uh, the only thing I've heard over the years is something around redirects, where I believe redirects would lose a refer. But I don't know if that's actually correct, or if that's just something I randomly heard. Uh, John, um, we actually had a, well, quite a few sites we've worked with that have had these issues. And uh, sometimes uh, redirects can be an issue, I think. I'm not sure if 302 redirects or JavaScript redirects are the ones that do not pass the referral. 301s should do it well. 
Um, uh, one of the big issues I've noticed is with um, uh, so tracking issues due to cookie acceptance uh, pop-ups where users might not accept um, the cookie right away. They move to another page and then they accept the cookie pop-up and then the referral is lost, the referring information is lost. Or they do get, let's say, from Google to a landing page and they accept the cookie pop-up and in order to trigger the analytics code, it does a refresh of the page and that refresh actually loses referral information rather than just push it directly you know, via Google Tag Manager or other, other ways. So, and this is when that Google traffic or whatever other source gets treated as direct. Okay, now that's, that sounds complicated. So, yeah. check in with me, hi, I guess. Uh, I, I can imagine now with, with all of those cookie banners and uh, that it actually does the analytics just when you accept everything, that probably makes it a lot harder now, yeah. This, this is generally a big issue, especially in Europe with the GDPR pop-ups. Uh, there are all kinds of plugins or custom implementations that people want to use in order to make sure they are GDPR compliant. And uh, sometimes this breaks the way Google Analytics is loaded and misses out on uh, the referral information. OK. Good to know. So I. I, I guess in, in future, I probably won't be able to answer this question either, but uh, may, maybe that helps a little bit to understand what, what kind of situations you might be seeing that, and probably also why you would see a rise in this kind of traffic over the last couple of years. I, I'd highly recommend the Google Analytics forums. Uh, OK. There really knows all about this, uh, these issues, so yeah. Cool. All right, so name the top 10 ranking factors that Google is wanting from the publishers. Yeah, I, I don't really have a list of top 10 ranking factors, so that's going to be kind of awkward. Um, I, I think, in general, what, what I would recommend doing is, on the one hand, making sure that you have a technically valid website that works really well from a technical point of view. And then on the other hand, focusing on making content that is something that people really want to see and uh, that is unique and compelling and that's not just rehashing other people's content, where you're essentially taking the expertise that you've gained over the years and presenting that to people who who are really keen on picking up this kind of content. And uh, that's not something that's easily refined into some, some magic number where you can say, well, I will focus on putting my keyword five times on a page. If you have bad content, you can put it on there six times or seven times, and it still won't change anything. Uh, so that's kind of the, the two pillars that, that I would look at there. On the one hand, really technically, a, a valid foundation to work on. And a lot of the common CMSs, a lot of the common systems that are out there, they, they do have really good foundations nowadays. Um, some CMSs have plugins that integrate things like uh, Search Console, Analytics, all of that. Uh, for WordPress, for example, we just launched uh, the SiteKit plugin uh, from our side, which is something that also automatically integrates Search Console, Analytics, and pretty much all of the, the various uh, Google tools for publishers. Uh, so that might be an option. And then that alone is not something that will make your site relevant to users. So you can have a fantastic, from a technical point of view, website. But if it's on topics that people don't care about, if your content is not something uh, that uh, is really on par with the best of the best of that kind of content, then you're probably not going to see a lot of traffic in search. So those two sides, they do need to be Hi, Don. Hi. Um, so I, uh, I wanted to ask something. Uh, first of all, uh, happy Halloween. And I like what you did with your hair. Um, so. Um, my website is in a, in a very spammy industry. Um, 
and still we work very hard to create high quality content original content uh, all all of our articles rank very well and shared in the community and bring a lot of traffic um we have great backlinks uh, big institutions all that so basically we really try to make sure to follow google's guidelines and recommendations um but doesn't matter what we do and how much effort we put into uh in, how much hard work we do our rankings they don't improve and they actually uh, they started dropping uh lately um some of our competitors clearly use scammy tactics that you guys always tell us to stay away uh, to stay away from um and although it seems like we perform better than them on every single metric we were able to see uh they outrank us um and so um and also in the past we've had someone spam our website thousands of spammy links we tried to disavow but i'm not sure i'm not sure we were able to get all of them um so i kind of wondered uh i'm we're wondering if there's something going on that we're not aware of we have any technical issue or um something that you maybe would able to see um if there's anything uh, spammy going on that we're not aware of um yeah that sounds like something where I I probably need to take a bit of time to to look into that or to to pass it on to someone to take a look. Uh, if you want, you can just uh, post a, a link to in in the chat here, and then mm -hmm. I can pick that up afterwards. Um, would it be possible to send it to you by email? Sure, you you can also send it to me by email. I. I just can't promise that I'll be able to respond directly by email because a lot of times uh, it's th these are things that I pass on to the teams and they take that uh, feedback and they work on that. But it's not that I'd be able to bring something explicit back to you and say, well, we fixed this or we changed this or you need to change this. Um, a lot of times that's really just one way path to, to the engineering teams. OK, I mean, so there won't be any follow up, but you would still have someone take a look at it. Sure, yeah. That would be great. And uh, also, I wanted to say uh, I come very often to Zurich. I was wondering if you're uh, planning to do another, um, you know, um, another one of these Hangouts where people come join you guys and um, join, join you in the, in the Hangouts like you've yeah. done last year. We should do that again. Those, those are always fun. Uh, we, we have the Webmaster Conference lined up in December in Zurich. Uh, that might be another opportunity, but uh, we, we should do that again. Those are always fun. Um, what, when is it in December? I don't know. It's like beginning, maybe first, first or second week of December. OK. That'll be nice. Uh, anyway, thanks, thanks a lot. Sure. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll run through some more of the questions here, and uh, then we'll have more time, I guess, for more questions. Uh, if I started link building and built 200 links in two days and then build zero links for two years, will Google see this as Black Hat and penalize me? Uh, so it, I, I think, on, on the one hand, we wouldn't see the building zero links for two years as Black Hat and penalize a website. So that's kind of the one thing. Uh, on the other hand, if you're building 200 links in two days, it's not so much the number of links that you're building in the short period of time. It's really just the matter that, that you're probably building links in a way that would not align with our webmaster guidelines. And that's something where, on the one hand, our algorithms might, might take action on that, where they might ignore those links. Uh, on the other hand, uh, our manual web spam team might take action there and apply manual action. Uh, so it's not, not so much the number of links in the time that you're talking about. It's really just the, the type of links that you're building or the type of link building that you're doing in general. So if you're dropping links to on random sites, if you're uh, buying links in, in various places, if you're exchanging links using some kind of a weird link network. Uh, all of those are things which would be against our webmaster guidelines, which would perhaps result in 200 links being built in two days. And uh, since they're against our webmaster guidelines, we do try to catch those algorithmically and ignore them. And uh, we do, from time to time, look at these things from a manual point of view, and uh, we may take manual action on them. Uh, so really, it's, it's not 
the number in the period of time. It's really the type of activity instead. Uh, do external links pointing to pages with URL parameters set to crawl none in Search Console hold any value? For example, one parameter is only used to track affiliate links. Will setting that one parameter to crawl none uh, effectively block any value? Uh, so th there are a few things that, that happen here. Uh, on the one hand, crawl none does not mean we will never crawl it. Uh, if you want something never to be crawled, use the robots text instead of the parameter handling tool. Uh, with the parameter handling tool, we will still occasionally crawl these URLs to kind of see if things are set up properly. Uh, so that's that's kind of one, one part there. Uh, the other part is what often happens with these parameters when they're set in the parameter handling tool is that we try to figure out what the canonical URL is for those uh, URLs. So you might have one URL set up uh, with, with a parameter where you say, well, ignore this parameter or don't crawl this parameter. Um, but that doesn't mean that we would not try to figure out what the canonical URL for this URL is. Uh, so with the canonical URL, we essentially mean the URL that we would try to index for that piece of content. Uh, so for example, if you have an affiliate uh, parameter that you have that you're passing there, and we've seen that this affiliate parameter can be ignored and that we can find the same content without the affiliate parameter, it might be that we have that, that connection kind of learned in our systems between the URL with the affiliate parameter and the URL without. Uh, so if you use inspect URL in Search Console with the affiliate URL with the parameter, it's possible, it's not guaranteed, uh, that we would know that the canonical of that URL with the parameter is the one without the parameter, for example. And when that happens, if we have a canonical URL for a link target, uh, then we would change that and say, well, this link technically points to this URL on your website. But we know this URL is equivalent to that one. So we will kind of route that link to the URL that we have as a canonical. Uh, so that would essentially mean that it's kind of the same as having a rel canonical on these links or a redirect, where you're saying, well, from this URL with the parameter, we're redirecting to the other one. Uh, you could, of course, also use a rel canonical. You can also use a redirect. All of those things also make sense, and they help us to figure out what the canonical URL should be. Uh, so that might be another option to do there. The other thing just to, to mention is that, uh, in general, we recommend using nofollow or uh, rel equals sponsored for affiliate links, because those links are essentially there because of a financial relationship between the affiliate site and the kind of the destination site where the links are going. Uh, so if you have a rel nofollow or the rel sponsor there, then in general, we wouldn't be passing any value anyway. So you wouldn't need to worry about this uh, in particular. But uh, those are kind of the different aspects that all play into this. So it seems like a simple question, but uh, lots of things that can play a role here. Uh, John, just a quick follow up. So uh, the role canonical tag doesn't clash with the uh, uh, URL parameter settings in any way. So it could, does it even make sense to use the URL parameter settings if it's uh, role canonical in place? So with with the parameter handling, uh, with the parameter setting, we would crawl those URLs much less frequently. So if you're seeing a problem that we're crawling too many of those URLs. Uh, finding the rel canonical and then going and crawling the canonical, then with the parameter handling setting, you can kind of simplify that. Uh, for most websites, crawling like that is not an issue. Uh, it's not that it would break anything if we crawl all of those URLs. Uh, so I try to avoid using those settings um, just because it's I, I always find it's, it's a very tricky setting. And if you set it up wrong, then suddenly we will not crawl things. And then maybe we'll actually miss something. Uh, so with the rel canonical, at least if something goes wrong, we'll still have that one URL that we can still crawl. OK. Um, OK, let's see. 
somehow these questions are all being cut off a little bit. Uh, a question forward from the last uh, Hangout. Uh, I received a security issue on content injection via Search Console for certain pages. I followed the steps, but I didn't find anything on the pages that's related to spam. Uh, is there a chance to have a? And then it cuts off. Let me see if I can refresh um, and get the rest of the question. Oh, here we go. Uh, to have a look to see if it's a false positive. So, uh, what? What often happens here is, so I guess there, there are two aspects here. On the one hand, sometimes we get it wrong, and we think that something is hacked when it's actually normal content. Uh, so that can happen if you have a bigger website that also includes some content that kind of looks like the type of content that hackers would put on pages, which might be around pharmaceuticals or, I don't know, casino gambling type content. Uh, if that's mixed in with the rest of your content, we might think, well, this seems a little bit odd. Uh, so, and those are the kind of issues that we we love to have flagged. And on the other hand, uh, hackers also use a lot of cloaking techniques to hide kind of the hacked content that they put into your site from the webmaster. Uh, in particular, they want to get this content indexed in Google, or they want to use it for phishing purposes, or something like that. And uh, to make sure that it stays around for as long as possible, they'll try to find ways to hide it from Webmaster. Uh, so they might do things that only show it to Googlebot user agents or Googlebot IP addresses. So it's really kind of tricky to find. Uh, what I would recommend doing here is maybe checking in with the Webmaster Help Forum. Uh, the folks there have a lot of experience with these kind of questions, and uh, they, they can pretty much take a look at that using the, the tools that, that are available to check to see what Googlebot would see or guiding you to using those and to find out more if it falls into the category of someone is hiding something on your, on your website or if it falls into the category of, well, this is maybe a bug that we should tell Google about. And they can also escalate it if there are issues that Google needs to know about. Um, one of my website provides information about various schools in my country. Each school has its own page with its own unique aggregate rating based on reviews, which my visitors submit. However, even though I followed all the guidelines, my aggregate ratings don't show up in the search results. What am I doing wrong? Um, good question. I don't know in particular what, uh, what is showing up on your site. So that's kind of tricky to say. I also primarily uh, suggest going to the Webmaster Help Forums to double check that with other folks. Uh, but in general, there, there are a few things that can be playing a role here. Uh, on the one hand, we've started showing uh, review-rich results only in, in a certain number of cases. Uh, so it might be that the type of content that you have with the re reviews that you have doesn't fall into the category of content that we would show in the search results. And if that's the case, there's nothing really that you can do there. It's essentially a policy decision on our side that we would not show reviews in the search results for that kind of content. Um, I would not recommend trying to circumvent that by saying, well, it's actually not this kind of content. So for example, if people are reviewing schools and you turn that around and say, well, this is a recipe, actually. It's not a school. Uh, and then that's something that, uh, from, from our side, on the one hand, we would try to recognize algorithmically. On the other hand, the manual web spam team would probably take a manual action on things like that. So I would not recommend doing that. Uh, that's kind of the, the one thing that, that comes to mind immediately there. The other thing is, in general, for rich results, we have different things that we try to uh, make sure that they, they apply before we show them in the search results. So independently of reviews or not, uh, in particular, the markup has to be technically correct. So using a testing tool to see that it's, it's correct is, is important. Uh, then the markup has to be such that it's kind of logically correct as well, in the sense that you're marking up things in, in a proper way that the item that you're marking up is really the primary item of the page, that it's the right type of item. Uh, like I mentioned, if it's a school, don't mark it up as a recipe. Uh, that's the other thing. Uh, and then finally, 
uh, we need to be sure that the, the website is of a reasonable quality so that we can kind of trust that the information that you're providing with structured data is something that we would like to show in the search results. So those are all kind of the different criteria that come to mind with rich results in general, and uh, especially with the kind of uh, review rich results that we show in search, uh, the other thing that I mentioned. Uh, we have a blog post specifically about the changes in review markup, I think from maybe two months ago, something around that. Uh, on my site, there was an issue with an author page. It was redirected uh, on my home page. And there were too many 301 redirections after the core update, and my site traffic went down. Uh, now I fix it. How much time will it take to restore? Uh, so I, I guess the, the good news is 301 redirects would not negatively affect your site uh, when it comes to changes like, like the core updates. Uh, 301 redirects would only cause a problem if that content were not accessible at all. So if you have an, kind of a circular amount of 301 redirects where you redirect to one URL and you redirect back, and that redirect goes back again, then we wouldn't be able to load that content then that would drop out of search, and then that would no longer rank. But it's not the case that if you have a redirect from one page to another, uh, maybe you changed some URLs, maybe you moved a part of your website within the website, that that would be a reason for us to drop a site in search. So in particular, if you're seeing changes after one of these core updates that we've announced, then that's something that, from our point of view, is not an issue on your website. It's essentially our algorithms thinking, well, maybe we judge the relevance of this website for those queries incorrectly, and we're trying to improve that. And these things are things that can change over time as well, where we think, well, in the past, we thought this was more relevant. And now we've seen that people see something else a little bit more relevant. So we'll try to adjust our relevance criteria. Uh, so it's not so much that you're fixing something and that it comes back, but rather if your site is no longer as relevant as it used to be, then you can work on making your site more relevant and making your site better in, in other ways. So it's not you're fixing it and it comes back, but rather you're improving it, and it improves in search over time. Uh, we have a blog post about core, core updates uh, as well uh, from sometime this summer, uh, where I, I would take a look at that as well. It has a whole bunch of things that you can look at that we recommend uh, folks kind of ask themselves in a serious way to figure out what they can do to improve their site overall. Uh, is there any impact if the path of my URL is 404 or even 310? Uh, so if you have like a domain.com slash path slash path and slash hash and a page name, if one of those path URLs alone is a 301 or 404? No, absolutely not. Uh, so uh, we, if we find links to that path directly, then we will see that as a 404. We'll see a link to a 404 page, like maybe there are other 404 pages on your website. That's fine. It happens. Uh, but it's not the case that we would take a URL and split it into pieces and try the individual pieces out. And if they don't work, then we would throw away the rest. Um, we, we understand that these URLs are essentially identifiers. And sometimes the path that you specify in there they're not actual folders with files on them, but rather an es essentially an identifier that is telling us, under this long URL, we have this content. And what might be if you split that URL up into pieces, that's essentially kind of like, well, we, we didn't tell you to look there, so you don't need to double check that. Uh, so from, from our point of view, if a part of the path does not work, that's perfectly fine. Uh, my client paid for PR in local newspapers and wants to post it on their website. What's the best way to do this to enhance SEO? Uh, so I, I guess 
kind of taking a step back in, in general, if you're paying for PR in a newspaper, then that's something, from my point of view, shouldn't necessarily be affecting your SEO. And so it shouldn't be the case that you would kind of pay to have more, I don't know, visibility in search. Uh, if, if there are links in these PR articles that are only there because you paid for them, then they should be appropriately marked with a rel nofollow or rel sponsored to kind of let search engines know that this link is a part of a paid article, for example. Uh, that can still make it useful for users. And uh, that can still mean that you can refer to it on your website. It's just that those particular links, they wouldn't be passing any, any signals to your website, which is in general, is, is fine. Uh, so doing this kind of promotion for your website, for your business, is, is perfectly fine, is perfectly natural. Uh, I, I think that's, that's something that almost always makes sense, where if you know that there's an audience out there that might not know about your website or about your business, and you want to bring your business uh, kind of in front of them, then finding a way to talk to them, which might be through a paid article like this, is, is perfectly fine and reasonable. Uh, it might be that this audience keeps coming back to your website, and then they recommend your website to other people, and then those links pass signals. That's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but it shouldn't be the case that uh, your website ranks higher because you're doing paid articles on other, other websites. Uh, so kind of the direct SEO effect generally shouldn't be there. Uh, indirectly, you, you can definitely see some, some effects there, too, where if your content is really good, your website is good, people will be happy to have gone to your website. And that's something that indirectly we might pick up. Um, ranking on some sites are related to their authority, but I see some better content on sites without this authority that rank worse. Can we treat this as a monopoly of information? So I don't know what a monopoly of information is. Uh, so that's kind of one thing. Uh, but I, I think the general complaint that, that I see in this question is uh, we, we have a really good website, and we think it's just not being recognized as being a great website in search. And essentially, why, why are other, other websites ranking above mine? And, uh, this is, I think, a pretty basic question when it comes to SEO. It's not limited to authority or trustworthiness or any of the other fancy new buzzwords that are out there. Uh, it's really just a matter of, well, some websites we show and we think they're more relevant to show to users, and some websites we think they're maybe not as relevant to show to users. My, my general advice here, with, without knowing your website, without knowing your specific situation, is to make sure that your website is not just as reasonable as the others, as kind of useful as the others, but rather that it's significantly better. Uh, so that it's, it's something where if our engineers were to run across this case, maybe in the forums, or if you posted about this on Twitter or anywhere, if our engineers were to see, well, for this query, we're showing this website at number nine instead of number one, they would be able to look at that and say, well, this website at number nine is clearly by far the best of all of the websites in the search results page. We should find a way to rank it number one. And that's something that our engineers do take very seriously. If they see that we're kind of really ranking something much worse than it absolutely should be, objectively looking, then that's something that they'll work to improve. It's not something that happens overnight. It's some, not something manual where they would say, well, we will just change the numbers behind this website at number nine to make it number one. Uh, but uh, over time, with our algorithms, we do try to improve that. But the, the foundation of that is really that the website that you're looking at is not just, well, we, we have just as good content, but rather something that is significantly better. Uh, so that anyone who objectively looks at the search results page would say, well, this is a bug. It's not, it's not like, well, it could be this way, it could be that way, but it's, it's clearly a bug. 
It's like if you ask Google, what is 1 plus 1? And uh, it ranks a website that says the answer is 3 on top, and the answer 2 is like ranked at number 9. Then objectively, like we're, we're doing bad search results there. Uh, but on the other hand, if the number 1 result says 2 as the answer, and the number 9 result says 2 as the answer, then those are kind of the same things. And it's not something where our engineers would look at that and say, we need to fix this, but rather, well, it's the same thing. What difference does it make to users if we show this one or that one in the first place? So really kind of stepping away from just focusing on individual factors and really thinking about what could you do to make your website significantly better, uh, objectively better than all of the others that are out there for this particular topic. Uh, an acquired domain that originally redirected to another domain, which currently has thousands of pages indexed. Um, oh my gosh, it's a complicated question. Uh, Domain.com redirect are cached and indexed. I added 410 status and removed URLs in Search Console, but I'm still seeing 5,000 results in the search results. Uh, valid URLs uh, indexed, not submitted, have dropped. Um, will those 5,000 results in search results drop, or do they need to continue submitting URL removals in Search Console? Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, the question is a bit complicated. I, I think what is happening here is you're moving from one domain to another, and we're still showing results from the old domain in the search results. Uh, in, in general, that's perfectly normal. That, uh, that happens all the time. Uh, and that's something that our systems try to do, much to the dismay of SEOs who are explicitly trying to move things from one domain to the other. In particular, if you're looking for one domain, and we know that content on that one So if you do a site query for the old domain, uh, you will still see results. If you explicitly search for the domain, uh, then we will still show those results. However, if you look at the cached page for those pages, then often you'll see that the cached URL is actually the new URL already. Uh, so our systems know that the old URL is an alternate version of the new one. And if you explicitly search for the old one, we'll show it to you because we're trying to be helpful. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean that the search results that you would see there are as indicative of any particular problem. Uh, so I would not recommend using the URL removal tools for that. Um, on the one hand, I, I think there are two reasons for that. On the one hand, you don't need to, because probably users wouldn't see these in a normal search results. Uh, on the other hand, the URL removal tool only hides things in search. It doesn't change indexing. Uh, so it wouldn't force things to shift over. It just hides them. Uh, so that when you do a site query, it's like, well, we would have 5,000 results, but you're hiding them, so we show you 2,000 results. Uh, so it's not, it doesn't really fix anything. Uh, so that's kind of the, the one thing there. So I would avoid using the, the removal tool for something like this. I'd use a removal tool for something that you really don't want to have shown in search, where if someone is searching for something and you removed it from your website because you urgently needed to remove it, then, then you can hide it in the search results. Uh, then it doesn't matter if it's indexed or not as long as nobody sees it. Right? If it's, for example, you accidentally leak some private information about the site owner and you fix it on your site and you just want to make sure it's not shown in search, then of course, go for it and go for it and hide it. Uh, with regards to the, the other options there, uh, setting 410 status code for these URLs or something similar, I would not do that. Uh, if you're moving from one domain to the other, then set up redirects. And uh, in the worst case, what, what can happen is if we show your old URLs in search, that redirect will still bring users to the new site. Uh, so in, in those cases, it's not that you would have any negative effect. Uh, from, from having your old URL shown in search because users still make it to your new site. So those are kind of the things I would do there. Uh, in particular, just 
continue using the redirects. And uh, don't worry so much if you're explicitly looking for a URL that we would show it, uh, because we our systems try to be helpful. And uh, as an SEO, as a webmaster, you're trying to find the objective answers. And uh, helpful systems sometimes get in the way there. All right. Um, wow, it looks like. Bunch more questions left, but also a bunch of things happening in here in the chat, which I haven't been able to catch up. Uh, anything from, from you all that uh, I should be covering next? Uh, hey, John. It's uh, Amos here. Hi. Um, I'm touching on Google for Jobs again. Um, we still face problems with our visibility there. So I was wondering if you um, could point me any in any direction um, how we could improve you know, our, our uh, visits uh, through Google for Jobs. I mentioned, I think, in a couple of Hangouts ago that we did a migration, and we saw a drop off. And I'm getting a lot of pressure internally to, to give some direction to the team on how we can recover that. OK. I, I will prod the team a little bit more on that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Jun. Hi. Hi, I'm Akshay from India. Uh, I've got a question that what is the best way to uh, combat the plagiarism? Uh, for example, my competitor is stealing the design elements of the uh, from my website that I created, and uh, it is taking advantage of it as it is, uh, as it is ranking uh, over me, right? Uh, I've already reported that uh, using the Google Search Console under the copyright removal, but uh, they said that. Uh, for each of the following URLs, please identify the asset content you have claimed in Frings upon the copyright. So I wrote a detailed essay to uh, your team, but they replied that it is uh, unclear to us whether or not you are the authorized copyright agent for the content in question. So my question is that how can I prove my authenticity and ownership that, yes, I uh, created this content and uh, I'm the owner and that uh, in Frings, uh, website owner is copying from me. So. I I can't really give you legal advice there, so that's that's kind of the the tricky part. In in that I I'm happy to help with with the technical side of, of these kind of things, but I I can't give you legal advice with regards to what specifically you should be submitting. So I think the DMCA complaint is generally the the right direction if it's copyrighted content that someone is is taking. Um, there, there might be some subtle differences there that uh, that you need to watch out for that I don't know about. Uh, so uh, is it limited to the text part, or uh, did you consider uh, the UX, UI, and design perspective as well? That if someone's stealing my image or uh, uh, like uh, changing the hue, uh, saturation, colors, and reposting the same image on their website, so is it considered as a plagiarized content? I don't know. I, I mean, I, I can't give you advice on that. That's something where you, you'd need to check maybe with, uh, with a lawyer locally to, to make sure that uh, what, what you're submitting re really fits. Um, I, I know there, there are sometimes sneaky people that, that copy things in sneaky ways where it's hard to differentiate if something is kind of just a copy or if it's actually a new work that is based on something else. Uh, but those are the kind of decisions that I can't make because I'm not a lawyer. Uh, so I can't give you advice on that. Uh, it's, it's something I, I see in the forums from time to time. Uh, what you might be able to do is, is double check in the Webmaster Help forums. I know there are some folks there that do have a little bit of a better feeling for the, the legal aspects there. Uh, but if you need legal advice with regards to what you can and can't do, then you really need to make sure that you contact a lawyer yourself. Sure. Thank you. Sure. All right. Hey, uh, John, I, I have another question uh, regarding flexible sampling this time. Sure. So I, it, it's about two years since flexible sampling was introduced. Um, I know that. Uh, there were a couple big publishers that Google worked closely with for a few months, namely, uh, I think, the New York Times. Um, and uh, we've implemented it on, uh, on our site. Um, and we've seen via a couple tests 
uh, some marginal improvement in organic search rankings. But um, I, I believe that, you know, given the limited information and uh, did some analysis of which publishers are currently using flexible sampling, some aren't even implementing it correctly. For example, economist.com um, is not doing it correctly. Uh, I, I don't believe the bostonglobe.com is doing it correctly either. Um, and, and given that we're an Alexa Top 1000 site, essentially we feel almost as if uh, flexible sampling has been a bit of a kind of neglected program. And given the size of the site that we have and that Google has historically worked with publishers on this project, uh, essentially I was wondering if uh, there'd be a way to uh, work more closely with Google on, um, on this project, especially given that we have a lot of data around um, the implementation of it. Uh, you're, you're welcome to send me something, and I can pass that on to your team. But uh, I, I can't promise that they would have time to, to look at this with, with individual sites. So no. Uh, I, I think, in, in general, with flexible sampling, the, the one aspect that's always, I, I think, a little bit tricky is that you basically have to find that line of how much content you show to users by default and how much content is behind your paywall, you kind of have to figure that out yourself in the sense that uh, for, for some sites, for some queries, it might be OK to show minimal amount of information because users really, really, really want to get to your content. And for other kind of sites, maybe it's worth showing a little bit more, so, so giving a few more pages that they can look at automatically or having a bigger snippet on the kind of preview part that they can look at. Uh, so finding that balance, I, I think, is probably hard. And that's something that more than probably the SEO aspect has also a lot of indirect um, aspects that flow into that as well, where if people always go to your site and they never get any content, then maybe at some point they just won't go to your site as frequently. Uh, on the other hand, if they go to your site and they get all the content they need, then maybe they won't sign up. So finding that balance between those two sides is, is sometimes tricky. And it's not something that I'd say is a, is a technical question or a question that we can solve for websites. But it's really something that you almost have to work out together with your users, with user studies. Uh, but again, if you, if you want to send me some information that I can pass on to the team, feel free to do that. I can't guarantee that they'll be able to get back to you, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to pass that on. OK, I appreciate it. Thanks. Sure. All right, uh, let me pause the recording here. Uh, you're welcome to stay on uh, for a little bit longer if you'd like, um, but uh, just so that we have a reasonable length for the YouTube video. Uh, thank you all for joining in. Thanks for submitting all of these questions so far. And uh, I hope you all have a fantastic weekend and see you next time. All right.